Good morning. I always hate interrupting all your good conversations because this is an important part of being in church, is being able to visit together. Welcome, glad you're here. Allow me to pray for, to begin our service. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be able to meet here. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that, that we're able to come and that our church is able to, to meet under the guidelines of the, the COVID rules. And so we thank you, Lord, that, that we're able to be here to encourage each other and to uh, bless each other and to worship you. Um, I pray, Father, that you would just be with each one of us, Lord. We've, we've, we come here carrying different burdens. We come here with different joys on our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that, that throughout this morning we will be able to share those things with you, to lay them before your feet, to worship you for all the good things that you've done, and to encounter you, to, to meet you in, in, a, in a way that, that means something very special and powerful to us. We open up our hearts and we open up our minds to you, Lord. Speak to us. Give us ears to hear what you'd have to say. And may we encounter you this morning in a way that would make our life different moving forward, that we may glorify and honor you in all that we say and do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, um, when Paul and I were living in Toronto, we attended a church where every single Sunday the pastor began the service with the same words. And these are words that were, they date back at least as far as 1577, so they've been around for a while. And every single week he would begin by saying, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. That's a powerful and beautiful prayer, inviting God to make himself known to us here. Now today we have to begin the service by saying things like, Keep your mask on, remain seated, that kind of thing. But even as we sing, you know, wearing our masks, even as we pray and listen and learn wearing our masks, God sees behind the mask. He sees our hearts, he sees our minds, he sees our spirits, and he sees all that we have and all that we are lacking and all that he can give to us. And so let's sing together. If you know this song, it's a wonderful old hymn. I'm not sure how old it is. I tried to look it up, but I don't know. I, I uh, didn't have time. I should have done it sooner. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to 
together from the scripture. We're going to read a passage that describes an event in Jesus' life that's near the end, so close to Easter, that uh, it, it, just, it says so much to us about his priorities and what was important to him in those last moments. Let's read these words together. Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own in the world, he loved them to the end. So he got up from supper, took off his everyday clothes, and dressed himself as a household servant. He poured water into a big bowl and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. When he'd finished and put his robe back on, he sat down at the table and said to them, Do you understand? You call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and you are correct to do so. Well, I've given you an example that you should follow. Do just as I have done for you. There's an old spiritual goes something like this. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When we're on our knees with our face to the rising sun, Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. The other great season that we celebrate together as a church is Advent. And every year during the season of Advent, which leads up to Christmas, there is one Sunday where we celebrate communion. This combination of Advent and communion ties together the beginning of Jesus' life on earth and the end of his human life on earth. Brings together the ideas of birth and death. During the season of Lent, there is always a Sunday when we celebrate communion together. And Lent is even more connected than Advent and communion because Lent and communion both talk about the end of Jesus, human life on earth, but it adds in the idea of a new beginning. Jesus' life, his human life on earth, had a beginning and a middle and an ending and a new beginning. He started his ministry on earth by telling people, follow me. To Peter and Andrew, he said, follow me. James and John, he said, follow me. To Matthew, he said, follow me. To Philip, he said, follow me. And they walked away from whatever they were doing, and they followed. Jesus, in the middle of his ministry and all through it, continued saying, follow me. To one of the religious leaders, he said, follow me away from your presuppositions. To another person, he said, follow me away from your sense of security. From another to another, he said, follow me away from your self-sufficiency. 
And to anyone who stood close enough, he said, follow me away from darkness. And nearing the end of his earthly life, Jesus was still saying, follow me. He said to his disciples, you who have followed me will follow me all the way and reign with me, with my Father in heaven. He said, I'm preparing a place for you and you can't come yet, but you will follow me and you will join me there in the end. And on this night, the night that's depicted in, in that window back there, when Jesus knelt down and washed his disciples' feet during their final meal together, he was still saying, follow me. He knew that before long it was going to look like all hell really had broken loose. And he was still saying, follow me. He took the time to set an example, to lay a pattern, to demonstrate, to effectively post a tutorial on YouTube of what it looks like to be one of his followers. One cup and a loaf of bread, broken, shared, and received. One bowl and an apron worn and carried and offered and used for the benefit of the people around him. An example for his followers to follow in life, life in the world, and life beyond. In that moment, Jesus was on his knees facing the rising sun. He was kneeling in the darkness looking for the new day that he knew would come. And he was showing his followers how to do that. Let's speak together the words that will be on the screen as a prayer saying, yes, we will follow you. Lord of life, Lord of death, Lord of rebirth, you shaped us in your image, designed us after yourself to become most fully human and most truly ourselves. We must become most truly like you, loving those who stand against us the same as we love those who stand with us, serving people whether they're in or out, whether they're above us, or beneath us, being a good example to each other, following each other's good example, living lives that show not just how good we can be, but how good you See with his 
sisters who we were made for kindness and they will know us by our Looking at John chapter 2 today, starting to read at verse 13. John chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made, he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple cords, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their temples. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show to show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Father, thank you for your gospel. Thank you for showing us who you are in your son, Jesus. And the many facets and aspects of his life including this one, which is kind of different from some of the rest of the things we read in the Gospels. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us through this story, through this piece of history, and that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So as Ruth was saying before, we're in the season of Lent, and this is the third Sunday in the season of Lent, which is a 40-day period which the church has historically designated as a time of, of preparation for, for Christians as we head towards Easter. And as in Scripture, Jesus' life journey headed toward the cross, so we in this season prepare our hearts to focus on the core events of our faith, the, the death on the cross and the resurrection from the dead of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now each Sunday in Lent has a particular scripture passage that's assigned to it. And the passage that we just read from John 2 is the Lent passage for this morning. And for many of you, this might be a familiar passage. And for others, this, this might be a new story to you. I've read the story many times, and to be honest, I never really strongly connected it with the Easter story. And as I read it again this week, I was wondering, so why is this part of Lent? Especially since it's found in John chapter 2. I mean, John has like 21 chapters, and the, the Easter story would be found more in the, the, the teens, John 18, 19, 20. This is in chapter 2, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, right after he had turned the water into wine at the wedding ceremony in Cana. It didn't seem connected to the Easter story, like I could say, which would be found at the end of Jesus' ministry. So I decided to find out if the story was found in any of the other Gospels. And as I did, it highlighted some principles of interpreting Scripture that I'd like to kind of share with you that hopefully will help us as we read the Gospels on our own and try to understand. So there are four Gospels in the New Testament. For a lot, of, a lot of you, this will be review, but, for, but there are four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each tells the story of the life of Jesus. Now, three of them are very similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
And theologians call these the synoptic gospels. And many stories of the life of Christ are found in these three gospels. And usually they're found in the same chronological order. And people smarter than me have studied these gospels and have concluded that they probably, the similarities result from Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of referring to each other's gospels and putting together their story, or even referring to yet other documents that maybe have been lost to history that have created this similarity in the three, the three gospels. And though these three gospels have a lot in common, as you look at the various stories about Jesus in them, you'll find that there are some differences and there are some similarities. And there are people beyond the church in the world who will point to those differences in the Gospels and say, hey, there's the proof. The Bible contradicts itself. The Bible can't be true. But in claiming this, they, they fail to understand that there's a purpose behind these three Gospels and why we're given three and not just one. I mean, if the Bible was a fake, why would whoever wrote it put in three different books that contain slightly different accounts of the same story where and it would be like apparently a contradiction. Why would they do that on purpose? There are at least a couple of reasons why there are differences in the stories between Matthew and Mark and Luke. One is that they're writing to different audiences. You don't say, you know, if you're going to write a letter to an eight-year-old, you don't write the same thing to a 70-year-old. You don't address them the same way. If you're going to address someone who has a PhD, you may not address them the same way you would everybody else. You would, we talk, talk to people and write to people based upon their, the audience. And Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. Mark and Luke are writing to Gentiles. And, he, and the two audiences in Mark and Luke had their differences. And such they'll only include in the story things that are important to their audience. The best example I always see is the Christmas story in Matthew. The first chapter of Matthew is almost entirely genealogies. You know, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so, kind of like in the Old Testament, and tracing all the way from David to Jesus. So, Because the point in Matthew's gospel, writing to the Jewish audience, is that he wanted to show that Jesus was of the line of David, that this, because of that, he could claim to be the Messiah. But for the Gentile readers of Mark and Luke, they'd be like, yeah, so? Why are you telling me this? this is, who's David? This doesn't mean anything to me. And so that's why there's these differences, the different audiences. Secondly, they, diff they offer different perspectives of the same event. Just become, because some details differ doesn't imply a contradiction. So imagine we had a car accident out here on the corner of John and Augusta Street. And three people saw it. One was standing on the front steps of First Baptist Church here, and they saw the accident, and they had their idea of what happened and how it occurred. The other person is standing in the reception desk at Dr. Guy's office across the corner, and they're looking at it out the window, and so their frame of reference is kind of limited, and so they offer a different perspective based on their frame of reference. And the third person is on the third floor of the Carlisle Inn, and they got a kind of a bird's eye view of the accident. And so they offer maybe a bit of a different perspective. Maybe they see things that the other two people didn't. Doesn't mean they're contradicting each other, but they each offered from a different perspective. And the police officers would come here and interview all three of them. And from those three, piece together the totality of what happened they, to be able to understand the full picture. And same thing with these synoptic gospels. From Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see three different perspectives on the same events. And putting them all together, we can get the fuller picture of what's going on in the life of Christ. So when you're reading a story from, about Jesus from, say, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, here's an exercise to try. Find the same story in the other two Gospels. And then if maybe if you have three Bibles or you can do it on a computer, put the three kind of side by side and look at them and see what the differences are, see what the different perspectives are, read them together, and then you get the fuller picture of what went on in that story. You get a fuller understanding of that particular Jesus story. So I said those three Gospels are very similar. But then there's John. The Gospel of John is very, very different. 
It's considered to be the one of the four that was written the latest, possibly as much as 40 years after the book of Mark was written. And it has a completely different purpose. While Matthew, Mark, and Luke offer a kind of a chronological account of the life of Jesus from beginning to end, John offers more of a theological account. His emphasis is not just on what Jesus did, but also on what he said and who he is. And the historical order of events is not as important to John as is, as is getting across to the reader an understanding of the purpose of the person of Jesus and his purpose, his mission. And so while Matthew, Mark, and Luke all place this story of Jesus in the temple immediately after Palm Sunday, so Jesus rides in on a donkey and the palm branches are being waved, and the very next sto story in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is Jesus in the temple driving out the money changers. This is like within a week before Jesus' crucifixion. That's where you'll find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in John, he puts it at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Some scholars think that these, it's because they, that Jesus actually did this twice, that he drove the money changers out of the temple at two different occasions, once at the beginning and once at the end. Others feel that John, and it is one event, but John put it earlier to make a point. But even as this story from John might seem chronologically disconnected from the Passion Week, from that week leading up to Easter, there are still messages in it that point us in the direction of Lent, the direction of the cross and the empty tomb. So our story begins with Jesus walking into the temple in Jerusalem, and it's like the fall fair. There's cows mooing, there's sheep bleeding, there's, there's Pigeons and doves in cages with their wings fluttering and making all kinds of racket. There are booths set up throughout the temple complex where currency is being exchanged. And Jesus was greatly troubled at what he saw. Now, I mean, on the surface, you might think, well, is the temple even still a temple? Is it like one of these churches in rural Ontario that, that has now become an antique market or a brewery or something? It's not even a church anymore? No, that's not the case here. There was actually, the temple was still being the temple, but there was actually a purpose for these sellers of animals and these money changers to be there. See, in Passover, people would come from miles around to Jerusalem. The, the population of Jerusalem tripled during the Passover week. And part of the Passover ritual for the Jewish people was the offering of sacrifices in the temple. And for those of wealth and means, they would offer cattle or sheep or goats. And those who were poor, poorer would offer pigeons or doves. Now, traveling a long way from wherever they were to Jerusalem with this unblemished, because that would be an unblemished sacrifice, so to come with an unblemished goat or, or, or a lamb or a sheep and travel all that way and keeping it unblemished, that was a tall order. Traveling with a birdcage with doves or pigeons in it, when you're already, you know, you don't have a whole lot and you've had to walk along the miles to get there, it's all, it makes an already difficult trip even more difficult. So these merchants were actually offering a service. Buy your sacrifice right here and avoid the hassle. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it quickly became something that overtook the purpose of the temple. You ever been to Rogers Center for a baseball game? I've been there a few times. Olympic Stadium in Montreal was actually much more comfortable. If you're over six feet tall, Rogers Center is like, your chairs are like, right? I don't know, Chris, you ever been there? You ever been there? It's not very comfortable if you're like, <laughs> if you're a large person. Olympic Stadium, you can stretch your feet out. It was great. I'm sorry. Montreal bias. But you go there for a ball game with the, you know, your family and you've paid like a day's wages for tickets. And you quickly realize, you know, you're going to need more money. Because pop costs five bucks, and a hot dog is eight bucks, and pizza is ten bucks. How do they get away with these prices? Well, where else are you going to go to get food? <laughs> you are a captive audience. And so it was in the temple. The vendors had a captive audience of people traveling a great distance. And they were more than happy to overcharge people for the convenience of one-stop shopping for all their worship needs. And the money changers were also there for a purpose. You see, there was this temple tax that had to be paid, and it had to be paid in the currency of the temple. 
And so travelers coming from different lands would have the currency from wherever they came from, and it had to be exchanged into temple currency so they could pay the tax. And of course, people saw a business opportunity here and were more than happy to charge 5, 10, 15, 50% commission on the currency exchange. And so what started out as a service to make worship easier quickly, quickly got out of hand. And instead of being a service to worship, it became a barrier to worship. And it made it harder for the poor. It made it harder for the foreigners to come and take part in the worship of the temple. And it made the atmosphere of the temple court anything but worshipful. Now, there have been times today when this passage has been used to justify the prohibiting of selling anything in the church building, such as not allowing a guest singer to maybe sell their CDs for people to take home or, or prohibiting a dinner in the basement where you charge admission to raise money. And while those prohibit prohibitions might be well-intentioned, I don't think the message here is no selling at all in the church building. I think the message, first and foremost, is you can't let it get out of hand. And second, not to let it or anything else distract from the primary purpose of church, which is to worship God and to encounter God. A bazaar to raise money for missions can be a good thing in a church, but, but not if people are, are more eager to spend months preparing for their bazaar and hardly ever show up in a church service or a prayer meeting. And we need to ask, are there other barriers that we put up that keep people from experiencing a house of worship here, a place to encounter God? I mean, COVID, <laughs> COVID has totally been a barrier that we don't have a whole lot to, 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 to do about. And we've done our best to try and work around it as best we can by putting services online and, and by coming here and obeying the rules as we come. But is there anything we, we do that might, I don't know, make the poor uncomfortable in coming here and create a barrier for them? Do we have any traditions that, you know, we understand because we always do them, but, but it actually makes it hard for any visitor to come and understand what we're doing and fully take part and have an encounter with God. Personally, I know two people in wheelchairs who would love to come to our church when the weather gets warmer. And right now, the entrances to our sanctuary are a physical barrier for them to come and worship with us. And I would love for us together to put on our creative thinking caps and come up with a plan to, to remove some of those barriers for them and make it possible for them to be here this summer. Whether it's tradition, whether it's money, whether it's our physical space, we want to do all we can to remove anything that hinders people from joining us in worship and encountering God. For it was these hindrances that angered Jesus. He came to tear the temple veil in two and to open up the way for all people to enter into the Holy of Holies, to en encounter God on their own without having a priest to kind of be the inter intermediary. That was his mission. And that's what happened the moment he died on the cross. The temple veil was torn and anybody could come into the Holy Holies and worship God. The story of his, this story early in his ministry is a foretaste of what he came to do to remove all the barriers that kept people from God. The account of this story in John gives details that the other Gospels don't. Remember we're talking about how these Gospels give a different perspective on the same story? Only in John does it say that Jesus made a whip and that he used it to corral all the animals and drive them from the temple courts. And then he, he upsets the money changers' tables and he sends their coins scattering all over the place. And finally, he directs his attention directly at the people who are selling doves, those who would be most taking advantage of the poor. And he tells them, get out. Tells them to stop turning his father's house into a market. Now, the other gospels refer to Jesus that saying, that they have turned a place of prayer into a den of robbers. And it is vital that first and foremost, the church is to be a place of prayer, a place where people can come and encounter God. But in John, the focus is a bit different. He refers to the temple as my father's house. 
And this is really the first time in the Gospel of John that Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God publicly. First time he claims any kind of divine authority in front of a whole bunch of people. An authority that makes him zealous for the temple, zealous for that primary purpose the temple was created as a place of prayer. And because Jesus is showing this type of special authority, the Jewish leaders challenge him. They ask Jesus for a sign, something, they're basically, who are you? Who are you to come in and, and disrupt our, our routine? Who are you to come in and, and make all this racket and this fuss? What well, gives you the right to waltz into this table, into this temple, and literally upset the apple cart and, and turn everything upside down? And Jesus responds with an answer that mystifies the Jewish leaders, but it's an answer that ties this story directly to Easter. And Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now at this point, I imagine the Jewish leaders were convinced this man is crazy. I mean, he comes in like a madman, driving out the merchants and the money changers, who, by the way, provide a source of income for the temple leaders as well. And he cries out in blasphemy, this is my father's house, claiming that God is his father. And now he thinks that he's some miracle-working stonemason who can build back in three days what took 46 years to put in place. But as usual in Jesus' life and ministry, they, they miss the point. If this happened early in his ministry, as John suggests, then even there at the very start, Jesus fully understood why he came. Those around him didn't get it until much later. But Jesus, even here, he's starting to state his mission. He is to become the temple. He is the one through, hu through whom humans will encounter God and experience God. No longer will they have to rely on sacrifices, for he will be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No more will they have to rely on priests as intermediaries between them and God, for he will be the great high priest, the way, the truth, and the life. No one will be able to come to the Father, the creator of the universe, except through him. He will be the one who will, put to death, who will be put to death and in three days will rise again. And he arose and is alive and he has sent his Holy Spirit to live within us as we welcome him, him into our lives so that we can become, as the Apostle Paul says, the temple of the Holy Spirit, ones in whom God makes his dwelling, ones through whom God works to make himself known in this world, ones through whom God is lifted up so that he may draw, draw all people to himself. The message of Lent, the message of Easter, is that Jesus died for our sins. The mess, that the enemy thought that, that the temple was destroyed on the cross, but in three days it was restored. Jesus rose from the dead, and now we, as God's creation, have the opportunity to encounter God in a new and living way. Because he is alive and he sent his spirit to dwell in us, we have the opportunity to encounter God anywhere and anytime. It's not about the building. Yes, God has given us a beautiful building, a useful building that we should respect and treat with care. We should always keep it primarily a place of prayer, a place to encounter God and never let anything, never let anything at all detract from that. We should be careful to remove any and all barriers that would keep people from encountering God in this building. But perhaps there's a message here that's also for us as individuals. If Jesus is the temple, as he says, and if, as Paul says, when we receive Jesus into our lives, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and we become, as it were, the temple of the Holy Spirit, then maybe an important question to ask ourselves is, who are the merchants and money changers in our lives? What are the things in our lives that are barriers to us becoming people of prayer? What are the things in our lives that, like cows mooing and sheep bleeding, they're, they're creating so much distraction and so much confusion that we lose sight of what's really important? And that's encountering God. 
Has money become so important to us that Jesus is left with no other choice than to flip over our tables, reminding us that no one can serve two masters, God and money, God and wealth. As we celebrate communion today, and as we journey through Lent to Easter, let us give thanks that we have been given a way to truly encounter God. We've been given Jesus, taking the place of the temple. Jesus rising again in three days. Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. Let us give thanks that through Jesus, we can encounter God anywhere, anytime. And let us be willing to examine ourselves for barriers. Barriers in the church that hinder people outside from encountering God here. And barriers within ourselves. Things that we allow to set up shop in our lives that hinder us from encountering God in all of his fullness. Let us be willing, with the Lord's help, to deal with those barriers. Even if that means having to disrupt things. Even if that means chasing things out of our lives. Even if that means flipping things upside down. Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed in this moment of silence. What are some of the barriers? Are there barriers that maybe we have as a church put up that make it harder for people outside our family to come and be a part of our community and to experience God? What about in our own lives? Are there things that we hold on to things that we pursue, that if we were to stand back and look at it, we know that those things are getting in the way of really encountering God the way we were meant to. Maybe this is a morning that we need to flip the tables over, chase those things out, say enough. My heart is a place of prayer. Take a moment in this silence just between you and God. Make this message personal in your life. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to destroy the barriers, to tear the veil in two so that we can encounter you and experience you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as a church to examine ourselves and to remove or set aside whatever barriers that might be here that would make it difficult for people to come and be a part of this community and part of this family, difficult for people for, to come to know you and encounter you. Show us, Lord, even the barriers that we're not even conscious of because we're so used to being here. We've forgotten how to look at things from somebody who doesn't know you exist. And Lord, help us in our own lives. Thank you, Lord, for even now putting your gentle finger on those things 
that are barriers in our lives to really meeting with you and encountering you and experiencing you. Give us the courage and even the righteous anger that we need to be like Jesus and to just rip through those things and say, enough. May our hearts and minds be devoted to you. May they be a place of prayer. Help us, Lord, to destroy the barriers and let them go, that we may know and encounter you in all your fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't think we've had communion since December, right? So this is a good chance for us to be together and to do this and share together. Sometimes some of the barriers we have in church is some of the language we use. And it's language we're not supposed to get rid of because it's so true, but sometimes it just takes a bit of explaining. I remember one time being in church 
and singing a song about the Lamb of God and re realizing there were some visitors there and just had to say, you know, we don't worship farm animals here. We're talking about how Jesus replaced the Old Testament sacrificial system where, where lambs were brought to atone for the sins of the people. And Jesus came to take that place. That system no longer exists. Jesus is the Lamb of God once and for all. And because of what he did on the cross, our sins are forgiven. And because of him rising from the dead, and he is alive, we are alive in him. And once a month, we, get, we come and take these communion emblems to symbolize the Last Supper that Christ had with his disciples. Where he said that this bread and this wine symbolizes the broken body and the shed blood of Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together this emblem of the broken body of Christ. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take together this emblem of the shed blood of Christ for our sins. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you endured on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for just tearing away those barriers so that we can know our Creator. Thank you, Jesus, for becoming the Lamb of God, for cleansing us in the, your blood that symbolizes your death, that we, our sins died with you and we are forgiven as we apply that to ourselves and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you have another song, or can we sing the last? Can we sing the last verse of Lamb of God again? Mm -hmm. So, last Aaron, if we can go back a couple of slides. Sorry to spring it on you, Aaron. Thanks. <laughs> Let's stand together. Make sure your masks are on. Let this song be our benediction for today.